Oh. Hello. Hello. Welcome to our fall semester Rats at Christie event. So glad you guys are here. My name is Andrea Morakoima, and I'm the president of Ratio Christi, uh, which is Latin for Reason for Christ. Um, this is a global movement that equips students across universities to give a historical, philosophical, and scientific reason for following Christ. It's beyond blind faith. Belonging together, um, bringing together faith and reason in order to establish the intellectual voice of Christ in the university, Ratio Christi is placing Christian apologetic, apologetics clubs at universities around the world. Currently, there are 90 clubs. Our Ratio Christi Club here at Rutgers meets weekly on Monday nights to wrestle with ideas relating to the intellectual credibility of Christianity. We believe that scripture commands us not only to develop our hearts, but also our minds in understanding the reasons for our faith. In a nutshell, Ratio Christi's goal is to reestablish a strong and reasoned presence of Christian thinking in academia. We seek to strive after Matthew 2237. Do any of you guys know what it is? Love the Lord your God by your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's right. That's right. Um, I know you guys know it. You're just shy. Um, we're very pleased to be hosting this debate tonight with David Wood and Farhan Karashi. The problem of evil and suffering is a serious objection to the existence of God. It is primarily posed as a threat to Christianity, but every worldview must give an account of evil that is currently within our system. Prepare yourself to think critically and deeply about this complex topic. It is an honor for me to introduce David Wood. He is a former atheist who converted to Christianity after examining the historical evidence for the resurrection of Christ. He is a member of the Society of Christian Philosophers, the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and the Hume Society, and has partnered in more than 30 public debates with representatives of atheism and Islam. You can reach David at his website at act17.net. Now, I would like to have William Wolf from the Atheist Student Alliance tell us about his group and Farhan. Then Farhan will begin the debate with his opening statement. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good so, evening. yeah. Hi. It is a, both my pleasure and my honor to be here tonight representing the Atheist Student Alliance, which is one of many secular groups on campus. Uh, now, the ASA is a fully student-run organization for the secular community here at Rutgers. Uh, but that being said, I, I think it's worth pointing out that our, um, that our meetings are attended by people with a wide variety of religious beliefs, uh, including but not limited to atheism, agnosticism, deism, and even theism. So while our self-defined mission statement may be to provide a sense of community to atheists, agnostics, and their companions on campus, we firmly hold that it is the uh, juxtaposition of belief and the you know, various religious affiliations on campus which really provide color and quality to our existence as a group. So therefore, we invite any and all to our meetings, which are held on Wednesday nights at 9.30 um, on the College Avenue campus in Scott Hall, room 203. Tonight, uh, the ASA has been asked to introduce the other half of the great debate, Mr. Farhan Qureshi, and I am honored to do this. He's, representing, he's here tonight to represent the position of agnosticism. Uh, Farhan is a former Muslim who defended the religion of Islam on the academic stage. He has defended theologians, philosophers, apologists, thinkers, and activists at universities, churches, and on media programs. He's now officially an agnostic and is the director of the website beliefrevision.com. He's currently pursuing a doctorate degree in clinical psychology and has worked in mental health for the past five years. So, please give Mr. Qureshi your full attention tonight and a warm round of applause to welcome him to the stage. Thank you to, uh, to ASA, to, uh, to Rutgers University, and to uh, Ratio Christi for hosting this debate. Thank you for David Wood uh, for joining me on this panel to discuss uh, a, a very vital subject, at least especially coming from my background working in mental health, and having to see human suffering uh, almost every day, uh, having to see people struggle with mental disorders such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and neglect and trauma, and seeing them struggle so hard, but yet 
regress constantly back to the same behaviors that they that they came in with. Um, especially when you think about the children uh, who, who are not physically developed, they're not psychologically developed, and they're enduring these experiences um, that are traumatizing them psychologically, but they, but, but, but these uh, sustained experiences, as, as we, we've learned from neuroplasticity and neuroscience, is actually affecting the, the, the structure of the, of the brain as well. And so when the structure of the brain is wired a certain way, these experiences completely uh, alter the individual's behavior and perception of reality uh, from then on. And so having in, in endured so much suffering, self-mutilation, suicidal ideation, the problem of evil was something that, that hit, 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 hit my heart pretty deeply. And it contributed to my leaving of, of Orthodox Islam um, some, some uh, uh, months ago, perhaps a year, more than a year ago. Um, the problem of evil is it basically states that if, if God is omnipotent, meaning all-powerful, and if God is omnibenevolent, meaning all-loving, then why would he allow evil? Or how can evil exist? Now, traditionally, certain philosophers may have tried to say that this is uh, perhaps logically impossible for evil and God to simultaneously exist, but that's not the position uh, that philosophers and thinkers take today. It is logically possible for God and evil to simultaneously exist. But is it plausible and is it feasible for God to allow evil and, allow <laughs> and, and, and uh, to allow suffering the way that we are experiencing in the world today? And so, before we get into some of those reasons that, that, uh, that David can give, I, I do want to look at the, the, the Christian theological perspective on why evil may exist. And, and we start with the Christian narrative that begins at the fall of Adam and Eve. Um, and, and it is the doctrine of original sin that signifies our desperate need of a savior. There are a few things to consider when pondering over the fall of man. The first issue is that the reality of the situation is that an omniscient or all-knowing God must have known prior to creating Adam and Eve that they would sin. God absolutely knew that they would sin, refused to create a situation where they could not sin, instead chose to create man with the capacity to sin, with the ca capacity for temptation, with, created the stimuli that tempts us, and on top of that created an entity or a serpent, or a satanic presence that further guides us to, 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 to evil or sin. Thereby, God created the precise circumstances for the fall. This means that an omnipotent and omniscient God could have chosen to create otherwise, but did not. One could never fathom why the Christian God would willfully choose to do such a thing, when he could simply create circumstances for sinlessness, bliss, and heaven to begin with. Now all of humanity were in Adam according to the biblical narrative when he sinned, and therefore anyone and everyone would have made the same mistake that he did. This, this spells out a level of determinism that demonstrates that the fall of man was inevitable meaning that God's foreknowledge before he created Adam and Eve that they would sin, and then stating uh, in the Bible that everyone is in Adam, it was, it was inevitable for Adam, and, uh, Adam to sin the way that he did. And as a result, all of the evil and, and, and suffering entered the world. So this is the biblical narrative. It spells out that because of Adam and Eve's disobedience of God, all of the suffering and evil entered into the world. And so humanity in their total depravity would endure countless suffering until the world ends. Other species seem to be ignored in the biblical narrative altogether, as if they don't matter. But nothing would ever um, take this suffering away from humanity. As a matter of fact, believers must endure it as well. The solution would only be encountered in the afterlife, and the solution for humanity would be 
uh, that God must come in the form of a Jewish man who will be violently and dramatically executed uh, as an event in time and space, thousands of years separated from the initial fall. This single event in the entire history of the universe would account for the sin that Adam and Eve committed, but only if the fallible individual believes it using their cognitive processes. If a person fails to come to this conclusion or fails to have the proper belief that this event occurred in our history for his or her own sake, then there will be endless suffering that awaits them in the lake of fire. So again, as we're noticing with the Adam and Eve scenario and as, as well as with, with the hell scenario, suffering is a response from God on disobedient human beings. So basically, we deserve to have all of the evil and suffering in the world because of our sinful nature that is also inevitable uh, according according to the that, that was also inevitable according to the biblical narrative so you are guilty of, of perceiving reality and living life without a conceptual belief in pro proper doctrine you have failed God's theological exam and this is, this is what will, will put you in a state of suffering that, can have, that, that has no theodicy. There is no soul building, there is no greater good, there is no free will, there's just suffering and misery and torment in the afterlife. So we see here that God is, is, is bringing suffering into the world for no other reason than to punish a rebellious creature that, that, that he created this way in, in the first place. So what this means is that the entire universe, all of time and space, all of the years that it took for the universe to expand and evolve, uh, the, the, the Big Bang, the, 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 the miracles of biology, chemistry, and physics, all of psychology and sociology, culture, advancements in technology, poetry, art, music, theater, film, comedy, none of it matters. The only thing that matters is that you believe that Jesus died for your sins. All of the political endeavors, all of the humanitarian efforts you see human humanity going through, it doesn't matter be unless you conceptualize and within the processes of your mind that Jesus is it di died for your sins. So the billions of lives that have been lived throughout human civilization None of it matters. All of your memories, all of your relationships, all of your sorrows, all of your triumphs, all of your experiences, your journey, your struggles, your integrity, your worth, your dignity, all of it means nothing because Jesus never knew you. He refuses to know you because you are a wretch whose works are nothing but acts of iniquity, uh, iniquity and anything that you could ever do that would be considered good would be considered like filthy menstrual rags according to the biblical narrative. And so, with that be the theological picture of, uh, of Christianity, where, where can, within the context of that, how can we look at the problem of evil? The next step uh, that I want to take is, 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 is more scientific. And, and because in the problem of evil, you have two types of evil that are identified by classical philosophers, that being moral evil and natural evil. Uh, natural evil. Natural evil is, think, think about the tornadoes, think about the earthquakes, think about the diseases and famines that afflict, afflict humanity, that, that bring about suffering to humanity. Is there a good reason for that? That is one, one question that, that the problem evil may look at. And another problem is moral, moral problems, meaning human behavior, the, the evil things that we do. Um, so, so there's two different types. And my argument um, would be that, that natural evil is actually the same thing as moral evil. Because when we're talking about human behavior, we have to understand it within the context of psychology, psychiatry, and neuroscience. We have to, we have to look at human behavior in this way. And what does this mean? So basically, when you think about the situation of human beings, there is this level of determinism. That, that, that is quite obvious. None of us had any control or choice over what time period we were born in, whether we were male or female, what genes we would inherit, 
what time period would you, you would be born in, who our parents would be, what our experiences would be as a child and adolescent when our bodies and brains are not developed, what internal and external stimuli is causing the behavior that, that, that we're demonstrating. So for example, if you were born as Adolf Hitler with his brain chemistry, with his genes, with, with his experiences and his upbringing, according to classical determinism, you would have done everything that he did. And same thing for anybody else. And so, and on top of that, you have to understand that there's this notion of classical and operant conditioning, meaning that the mind can, uh, can be psychologically conditioned to perceive reality a certain way. So if you were born as a Muslim and you had positive experiences as a Muslim, you become attached to your identity as a Muslim. And therefore, if anyone comes to you with challenging your preconceived notions, your, the, the defense mechanisms such as denial are going to kick in, and you're going to spontaneously deny whatever evidence the Christian or the atheist is bringing to you. So there's this emotional attachment to our identity. There's this psychological conditioning, this indoctrination, this brainwashing that can absolutely affect what our biases are and what our perception of reality is. And given that scenario, how can anybody in their right state of mind deny the truth? So with, with, with the cycle, so, so the next the next phase that I want to look at is 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 the reality of suffering. Each and every one of us has gone through sickness. Each and every one of us has gone through a death of, of, of a loved one. Each of everyone has witnessed, at least uh, uh, whether in our own lives or, or in the lives of others, uh, people go through very difficult and traumatic times. So the, the, the question is, what meaning can we derive from these experiences? Is there a greater good? Is there free will in the, in, in the suffering that we're going through? And I would contend that there is not. For example, a good friend of mine is, is enduring multiple sclerosis. Patients that I've worked with hear voices that torture them. What, what moral values is this teaching them other than, uh, other than to feel sorry for themselves and not know what to do in their, in, in their situation? Other than, 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 than hope that God would save them in, in the afterlife. And so, the theodicies that, that David will bring, they, may, they might be logical possibilities, but do they do justice to the reality of suffering? Do they do justice? Do, do they bring about any further meaning or value other than, 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 than us going through traumatic experiences that, that are affecting ourselves and our families uh, and, and our loved ones? Um, so, so with that, I think I'm going to um, end my opening statement and, and listen to David's opening statement. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'd like to thank Rutgers University for hosting our debate tonight and Fratio Christi for organizing the event. Um, Joseph Joubert said that it's better to debate a question without settling it than to settle a question without debating it. And uh, I don't know if we'll settle the problem of evil tonight, but we're uh, definitely going to debate it. Um, I'd also like to thank Farhan for uh, giving me this opportunity to school him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, Farhan and I have been friends for years. Uh, we've, uh, we, we debated many times when he was uh, still a Muslim, so 
Uh, we've been friends for a while. There might be um, <clears throat> a bit more trash talking than normal tonight, although probably going to be coming from my side because uh, Farhan's uh, a lot nicer than I am. Uh, well, we're debating uh, the problem of evil, of course. Um, if God, why evil? And I'm pointing this out because uh, a lot of what Farhan said in his opening statement uh, is very loosely related to the problem of evil. If you're talking about uh, the uh, uh, sacrificial death of Jesus or uh, suffering in hell or something like that, the, the strength of the traditional historical argument from evil has been that it's based on premises that kind of everyone accepts. Here's what the definition of God is, and here is a bunch of evil around us. How can you reconcile these two? If you start bringing in Adam and Eve and Jesus and so on, it's, it no longer becomes a, a problem that's, that's a problem for everyone, a problem, a, a problem that's, a, that's a, a problem just for the existence of God. So uh, I'm going to focus on the traditional problem, if God, why evil? If God exists, why is there evil? If I have time to answer some of the other issues that, that Farhan has brought up, I'll, I'll, I'll do that in my rebuttals. Um, Farhan says that moral evil and natural evil are the same thing. I just want to point out that there is at least uh, a conceptual difference, and that's important to keep in mind because different responses to the problem of evil might focus on explaining one kind of evil rather than another. So um, traditionally, there, the distinction has been between, on the one hand, moral evil. So uh, we have terrorist attacks there. Moral evil usually uh, will always involve some kind of moral agent. So someone deciding, I am going to do something bad. So we call it moral evil because it involves a moral agent. So uh, some examples here, we have uh, terrorist attacks. Um, Clowns, ghosts, <laughs> little mustaches, things like that. Uh, no, of course, this is uh, Hitler, Ku Klux Klan. This is a serial killer. Uh, some of you young people, this is before your time. This is John Wayne Gacy. He uh, killed and did other bad things to uh, over 30 uh, young people and buried them in his basement. Um, but that's all. Th these are all examples of moral evil. Um, and we have natural evil, uh, pretty straightforward. This is... Uh, evil that doesn't involve a moral agent. Uh, so this is smallpox, a uh, very big problem back in the day. Um, this is the Japanese tsunami, uh, really cool picture of a tornado here. And uh, this is one of my sons here, he has a genetic muscle disorder, but uh, these are all examples of evil where no person seems to be at least directly involved. Of course you can, you know, you could give a person smallpox if you had some of the virus or something like that, but usually these things spread by purely natural means. So, the question is, uh, for theists, since we are positing the existence of a perfect creator, perfect in goodness, perfect in power, perfect in knowledge, uh, why are things like this rather than some other way that we might expect? Um, so given what we're saying about the origin of the world, you might expect the world to be pretty different from the way it actually is. And so uh, this is uh, the problem of evil, a problem for people who are positing a certain type of cause of the universe. And there are lots of different ways that theists have or can uh, respond. I'll point out three kind of broad categories here. Uh, one, people can find problems with the argument. The argument from evil is just that. It is an argument. And if you have an argument, you are obliged to defend your premises, to show that your logic is valid, to show that your conclusion follows from the premises you've laid out. And like all other arguments, we can uh, subject that argument to criticism and say, is this a good argument? Are the premises true? Does the logic follow? Uh, does the conclusion follow from the premises? And so on. And so the, some of the standard problems that you look for in an argument are inconsistencies, um, here I'm thinking of, might get to this somewhere later if I have time, uh, but inconsistencies. I, I see a uh, big inconsistency in methodology when we come to the argument from evil. And just to give you an idea, um, I find lots of times, not necessarily for Han or anyone in particular, but I find lots of times that an atheist will have uh, an extremely high burden of proof for any argument for theism. But we turn to the argument from evil, and I can point out all kinds of problems with the argument from evil, and it's still a good argument, no matter no matter what. And so the, the idea here is we would have to pay attention to our uh, to our level of uh, skepticism, or uh, make sure we're being consistent. Um, we can have unproven assumptions. Sometimes we have an argument, we use an argument, 
and we're assuming something throughout the argument and it might not have been pointed out and it might not be true or uh, defensible. So just an example here, one of the most popular responses now in the philosophical literature to the problem of evil uh, is, is sometimes called skeptical theism. And it goes basically like this. Uh, when atheists are saying, why is there so much evil in the world? Can you explain this evil? What's being assumed there is that if God did have reasons for every single instance of evil in the world, God had uh, a reason in his mind, this is why I'm going to allow this evil, what possible basis would there be for thinking that we would have access to those reasons to communicate them? So the idea here is that, you know, if you think about our intellects compared with God's intellects, that God's intellect is, whatever it is, is vastly greater than ours. And so, if God had reasons, we'd have no basis for thinking, oh, and we're going to be aware of those things. And so this is the position of skeptical theism. It says, in your argument, in the argument from evil, the argument you're using against theism, you're assuming from the beginning that if God had reasons, we would have access to them, and you have no basis for that assumption. How would you, even as an atheist, maintain seriously that I am somehow intellectually obligated to have access to God's reasons when we're having this discussion? And uh, even many non-theists uh, who are involved in the problem of evil are starting to uh, grant, yes, there's a problem. There's a problem with the argument. We have to do something about uh, this assumption, this, this assuming that we're that the theist is obligated to have access to God's reasons. Uh, so these things need to be pointed out. Ambiguous terms can be important because sometimes people are using words in different ways. And just as a very basic uh, example, the term good. In many traditional versions of the argument from evil, uh, the person employing the argument is using the term good, when we say God is good, to mean something like uh, God is a pleasure maximizer. Um, it's a, it, I don't think it's much of a coincidence that the, uh, the sort of founder of the logical version of the argument from evil was uh, Epicurus, who uh, the, the, gate of, the gate into his house said, pleasure is our greatest good. And so if you're taking the greatest good as pleasure, well, then the argument from evil follows pretty naturally. God is good, then he's going to be really concerned with giving people lots of pleasure, and we don't have that kind of pleasure, therefore, theists have a problem. But generally, well, I don't know any theist who thinks that that's what we mean when we say God is good. You're normally thinking of something like holy or something like that. Um, and there are even theists, uh, certain Thomists, uh, followers of Thomas Aquinas, for instance, who say that when we talk about God being good, we, we don't even mean that God is morally good. They don't believe God is a, is a moral agent at all. They mean something very different by the term uh, good. So it's important to get our definitions clear if we're saying that there is a, there's a clear problem here. Uh, so in other words, uh, if there are problems with the argument itself, if we can point out problems with the argument itself, the theist, until those problems are kind of dealt with, since this is an atheist argument, this is an argument of the atheist, um, until those things are kind of cleared up, it's one option for the theist to say, hey, your argument has a problem, so if you're asking me if God exists, why evil, I, I, don't, I don't see a problem yet. Until you clarify why there is a problem and show that you're being consistent, show that you're not assuming anything that shouldn't be assumed, and show that you're using your terms clearly. Uh, but assuming that the, um, the atheist or the skeptic or the agnostic does deal with those issues, then it uh, might fall to the theist to try to explain the evil. And there are various ways we can do this. Um, theists, uh, your average theist historically would defend, um, would defend the existence of evil by, theologically, because that person is part of a religious tradition. Um, philosophers would defend it uh, a bit differently, so we'll uh, mention both of those. And finally, uh, since, as Farhan pointed out, this is not, uh, philosophers don't believe that there's a logical contradiction anymore, as Farhan pointed out, that there's a, a contradiction between the claims God exists and evil exists. It's considered an evidential, an evidential problem. Um, the evil we see around us, or the amount and extent, or the kinds of evil we see around us are some kind of evidence against the existence of God. And so evil is evidence against theism. Well, if evil is simply evidence against theism, then it's up, it's open. It's one option for the theist to say, okay, it is. Uh, it's evidence against me. But now I have uh, greater evidence for my position. And so the theist could say, yes, that is a problem for my view, but I have much greater evidence supporting my view than you have against it. Now, um, I kind of like the way uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, through Sherlock Holmes, 
breaks down the, the problem of evil, uh, because it, it, it's kind of how I think, and we're going to get into the idea of explaining the evil here. But this is a part of a story called uh, The Cardboard Box, and uh, it's a story about a husband and a wife, and um, tragic story ends with the husband in, in jail for murdering the wife and so on, and they had loved each other deeply, and you see in the story how things broke down and uh, led to a horrible situation. And Sherlock Holmes is sitting there uh, reflecting on the situation. Uh, what is the meaning of it, Watson? Said Holmes solemnly as he laid down the paper. What object is served by this circle of misery and violence and fear? It must tend to some end, or else our universe is ruled by chance, which is unthinkable. But what end? There is the great standing perennial problem to which human reason is as far from <coughs> the answer as ever. Now the reason I like why, the, why he sets it up like this is he says, look at all this suffering. What's the reason for all this suffering? <coughs> there has to be some reason for all this suffering because otherwise the un universe is, ru is ruled by chance and that's unthinkable. Therefore there must be a reason whether, I have, whether I'm aware of it or not. And the reason I like that is if, uh, Sherlock Holmes is famous for uh, reasoning, it's called reasoning from the impossibility of the contrary. It's, it's, uh, uh, once you eliminate the, the impossible, whatever is left must be the truth. And here, Holmes takes it as unthinkable that the universe is ruled by chance, and so there must be a reason for it. And uh, well, I'll show you why uh, I, I like that approach. And I'm going to give a uh, kind of analogy here, um, because you know, if you're a theist, you, you view the world in a certain way. You view it as a, as a creation of God. And if someone comes along and says, aha, here's this problem, does it mean uh, it's all that easy to abandon uh, the entire way you view the world. And so let me give a, a kind of what, what I would see as a, a partial parallel, not a perfect analogy. But uh, this is the Venus de Milo. Uh, it was discovered in an underground cavern uh, in the island of Milos uh, nearly two centuries ago. And someone immediately recognized this as a sculpture. And now it sits in a museum. Uh, but suppose I challenged that claim. Suppose I wanted to challenge that this was a statue or that this is a sculpture. Um, I might say, uh, you claim that this is something that was made by a sculptor, but I find that a little bit ridiculous because uh, what kind of sculptor would make a statue of Venus with uh, no arms? I say, if anyone worthy of the title sculptor had made this thing, he would have put some arms on it. And since I would expect there to be arms, and yet I find none, obviously, obviously this can't be the work of any kind of sculptor. It must be a natural rock formation. <laughs> now you would all immediately see the problem with that. You'd say, yeah, but there, there's a lot of other things in there, right? There's a lot of other things, and you can't, just because you wouldn't expect uh, there to be this problem of armlessness, uh, doesn't mean you can rule out uh, a sculptor. And uh, that's how lots of theists would view the world. Yeah, we do see some big glaring problem, some big gap uh, in, the, in the world where things should, should be that we would expect them to be. Um, but there are other things at work. And if you were looking at this and someone tried to make an argument like that, so if God, why evil? If a sculptor, why armlessness? Uh, you would immediately say, well, there must be reasons why the statue has no arms. There's got to be a reason. I'm not going to throw out the idea of a sculptor. I'm going to uh, ask myself why uh, this doesn't have arms. And so you'd say, most obviously the arms broke off, but even if we found out somehow that, that this thing had never had arms, you'd come up with some other reason, right? So uh, maybe it's a sculpture of an armless woman. <laughs> an armless woman came in, I want I wanted to make a sculpture of me, here's some money. Uh, all kinds of reasons. Or person was sculptor was making the statue, was adding parts to it, and you know he didn't get around to the arms. He had a heart attack before he uh, got to the arms. Something like that. But we would demand a reason, and even if we couldn't come up with a reason, we would never abandon the idea of a sculptor. So how would we? What kind of explanations could we come up for allowing evil in the world? Well, um, Farhan has brought up a couple of different um, options. One, he has appealed to. Uh, uh, Christianity and arguing what the what the Bible claims about the introduction of evil in the world and that is how lots of people would respond they would attempt to show that evil the existence of evil or suffering is part of a coherent uh, religious system right so evil forms one part of their religious system but it fits into the system given other things that the religion teaches 
And then we have philosophical arguments which uh, approach it differently and they simply say, if an all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good being existed, what reasons could there be for God to allow evil? And so we'll look at a couple of those uh, with the time I have. Take something basic like sin. I'm pointing this out because um, I grew up as an atheist. I used to argue with Christians and I never once used the argument from evil. I used other arguments. I would say things like, here's a pen, tell God to move it. Uh, can't. Uh, science already explains where the universe came from. We don't need God to explain things. Things like that. Never crossed my mind to use the argument from evil. And there was a reason. I understood, even back then, if some sort of absolute standard of perfection exists, we're pretty bad by comparison. And it never crossed my mind that God was somehow morally obligated to give us a hedonistic paradise, give us a perfect world, given the sorts of things that we do. So this is, this is related to uh, how Christianity and Judaism and Islam uh, deal at least with some sin, and that uh, God certainly is under no obligation to give us a perfect world, given the sorts of things that we do. And this is important because a lot of the argument from evil is based on the horrible things that human beings do. And the more examples you pile up of the horrible things we do, the more you kind of lose... Uh, this idea that God has to somehow uh, rescue us when something goes wrong. The more examples of people like Hitler uh, that you pile up, the less obvious it becomes that God is supposed to rush to our aid whenever something goes wrong. Um, so a, that, that's a, that would be one example of a religious doctrine. Uh, we also have theodicies in philosophy. Um, so a theodicy is an attempt to answer the question, what morally sufficient reason could there be for God to allow evil? And for Hannes mentioned some of these, we're going to uh, debate these here. Uh, but let me give some examples. <laughs> this is from the movie The Stepford Wives. Uh, if you um, didn't see it, uh, it had a scary version. It was a horror movie way back in the day, and then they made a remake, which was uh, more of a comedy. Uh, but the idea of the movie is you take your wife to this town, and in the, the newer version, actually put a chip in her brain. The old one, they replace her with a robot. Um, but uh, your wife is going to be replaced with a perfect wife. And so the, the idea is uh, you could program your wife to be the perfect wife, perfect in every way for you. And the question towards the end of the movie is, uh, is that better than a real wife who isn't going to do everything you want? Uh, but is actually making the decisions on her own. And so the idea is one about free will. Uh, is it better to have someone with free will uh, who isn't going to do the right thing all the time than someone who's programmed to do the right thing? So the idea here is uh, if God's going to allow free will, uh, a world with free will would be better than one without free will. I'm not saying this explains all evil or even most evil. I'm saying uh, this is something that human beings recognize as important and can play a role in why God might let us do uh, some of the things we do without interfering. Next we have, and I'm almost out of time, so I'll go quickly, uh, soul-building theodicies. Um, the idea behind a soul-building theodicy is, uh, and you, this is, again is something you, you probably know or are aware of, is you tend not to grow during the easy times in your life. And so, uh, a soul-building theodicy says one of the reasons for allowing us to go through at least some suffering in our lives is that a world without suffering would be a world without any kind of moral development or spiritual development. And so in order to have a world where we grow uh, morally and spiritually, we need to go through some things. Once again, I wouldn't say that this explains uh, all evil, but it's one reason for allowing some suffering. We, we have some uh, uh, additional uh, theodicies to go through. I'm out of time, so I'll get to those in my rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, thanks, David, for that opening statement. I, I think that there's a couple of things to cover. First, the, the issue of, of uh, natural evil and moral evil and how there's a difference because with moral evil you have a moral agent and, and, my, and that also stems a little bit into the free will theodicy that David brought up was that how much uh, uh, how much choice does the moral agent have in the matter just like we don't have any choice over a natural disaster such as an earthquake or or um, or, 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 or a disease that, like cancer or something like that um, 
how much uh, choice do we have? And, and I would say that, that there's, as a determinist, I would say that, that free will is illusory. I would say that free will is not, uh, we, we don't have the choice that we think that we have or that we perceive that we have because there are a plethora of circumstances that, that impact the, the, the behaviors that we exhibit. Again, all of the, 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 the things that I mentioned is, like, for example, you don't have any choice over you, whether you be male or female, what genes you would inher inherit, what brain chemistry you have at, at, at any given moment. So for example, if I have a Coca-Cola and, and a Sprite in front of me, uh, at that moment, th th there's a brain st state that might choose one over the other. And, and that heavily depends on what, 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 the, what the brain state is, whereas the next day I might make the, the, the opposite choice, uh, uh, make, make the opposite choice. Now determinism is classically defined as antecedent causal circumstances. So basically this is, this is the current set of affairs, our meeting, and there's antecedent causal circumstances that brought us here. <coughs> There had to been a level of interest. There had to been some type of advertisement that we came across. So there are ante there are antecedent circumstances that bring us all to the current set of affairs. And so, with any moral agent that we're talking about, the reason why they would choose to do one thing or another is because of the antecedent circumstances in that, that involve uh, both genetics, and the, both the, the nature and the nurture aspects of of of, of, of human. Uh, choice. So as, as the example that I gave, if you were born as Adolf Hitler, in his circumstances, with his upbringing, with his environment, with his parents, with his experiences, with his brain chemistry, you would have done everything that he did. If you were born in the 1930s in Nazi Germany, if you were born in the 1860s in Confederate America, you would have been conditioned according to that environment. And, 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 and your perception of reality would be heavily shaped throughout uh, the human uh, lifespan development. And so my, my argument would be that the moral agent is acting on, on, on impulses that are out of his control every bit as uh, an earthquake is out of his control. So w when you look at a killer and he kills somebody, it's not an isolated situation of that man killing that person. That person had to have gone through a lifespan that got him to that point of, of, ki of killing or raping or doing whatever the, the unfortunate uh, crime that he did. It's never an isolated situation. There's a plethora of, of psychological disturbance there. Um, now, the main thing that I heard from David is that the theist is not obligated to know why God would, would cause, cause evil. But that still doesn't take away the problem that there is human suffering. And why would God allow that? And from, from what, the reason why I brought up the Christian theological uh, premise is because we, we, we understand that God knew. God is omniscient. God knew that Adam and Eve would sin. God knew evil and suffering would, would enter the world. But he chose to create that situation. And, 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 God, and, so, and we're talking about the omnipotence of God, too. So not only does God know before he creates Adam and Eve that this would happen, but God had the power to choose to do otherwise, but did not. And so even if we don't know why the problem, what, what the answer to this problem is, it still doesn't take away the fact that it is a, that it is a problem, and, and uh, that, that, that it is a problem. Now, in terms of soul building theodicy, it would be one thing if, if you were talking about Hinduism, where you have reincarnation and the soul is constantly building it, itself up to a point. But with Christianity, uh, there, there, there's no purpose for soul building because you are born with original sin. You are inevitably a criminal in God's eyes. Your, your works are acts of iniquity um, and mean nothing to God. Anything good that you could do is, is, is as, as it's in the Bible, like a filthy rat. And so, what purpose would there be for what purpose would there be for any soul building in, 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 within the context of Christian theology? Theology, I, just, I, I don't understand that part. Um, the only thing that you could do is believe in your mind that in, in our history, Jesus died for your sins. That's the only good thing that you could do to save yourself. Other than that, anything that, that you, good that you might do, any intellectual pursuits that you might have, any humanitarian efforts you might pursue, irrelevant. Because you fail to 
conceptualize within the processes of your mind uh, that, that God must have incarnated himself as a Jewish man who must be violently executed uh, in, in, uh, 2,000 years ago in the Middle East. So those, I mean, th those are the two primary uh, arguments that, that I saw from David is, A, we don't know why God allows evil. We just don't know. But that doesn't take away the, that, that, the reality of the situation that, it's, that it is a problem. Uh, and that suffering is real. And it's, ex and it's experiential. This is more than just a philosophical debate. Because it, it's very easy to say that I am not a child suffering from malnutrition in Africa. Or that I'm, that, that I'm not a child who was molested for 10 years by, by my own biological father, hypothetically. It's very easy just to, to, just to brush these things off as, as, as you know, a philosophical, a logical debate between two individuals. But these things are very experiential. If there is a reason that we are enduring this suffering and that this is impacting entire lives, people live and die with suffering. And it's so easy for us to, to sit here in America and, and, and just brush this, these things off because we're not in, in, encountering them in our own personal lives. We could have easily been born as somebody who, who, who's experiencing countless, countless suffering. So these are the two, uh, the theodicies that David presented, free will, which, which, I, which I absolutely... I mean, I deny, because I don't know what free will is. How do you explain free will empirically? Or what, what is the definition of free will given, uh, given the, the, the clear depiction of, of determinism uh, and, and the psychological evidence that we have in terms of human behavior? I, I still have yet to... Uh, in exploring the, 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 the issue of free will and determinism, I, I, I've yet to to have a concrete definition of what free will is. Um, if you say it's the ability to, to, to choose, then, then we have to, again, understand that the choices that we have are limited. The choices that we have are determined, meaning, meaning that they, they are choices outside of our control. Um, and that, that there is a plethora of conditioning there and that there's this unconscious mind that absorbs all of our experiences, and so the conscious experience that we're having has it has a plethora of, of unconscious phenomenon that, that is affecting it. So what this means is, if you go through life as a, as a child and adult as, and as an adolescent and endure and endure a particular type of conditioning, then then your conscious experience will reflect that without you consciously realizing what it is that's influencing your your, your behavior at that moment. And so all the evidence stacks up against free will. We, we don't have any choice over, over the suffering that we must endure. The suffering, uh, in, in many circumstances, is intense. Why must this happen? I mean, these, these are the questions of the problem of evil, and, and, and I guess I'll be hearing from David and his rebuttal more uh, in terms of uh, determinism um, and trying to see natural evil and moral evil are the same thing. I began by pointing out that the strength of the argument from evil, the, the reason that it tends to do better, the, the reason that it's been more successful than other arguments against the existence of God, is that it rests on premises that seem, uh, that seem pretty obvious. Right? It's obvious what theists are claiming by the term God, that God is a uh, perfect being, perfect in power, perfect in knowledge, perfect uh, in goodness and that this belief might lead to certain expectations about the way the world should be or the way the world shouldn't be, and we look around and we're kind of surprised at what we find here in the world. And so the traditional argument from evil is based on claims about what the doctrine of God is, that's straightforward, and it's based on the idea that there's lots of evil in the world. That's obvious. And so that was the traditional strength of the argument from evil. 
uh, Farhan has been eating away at the strength of the argument so far in this debate by making it depend on things like hard determinism or particular uh, interpretations of doctrines of, of Christianity. And uh, we'll see what that does to his argument here in a moment. So Farhan responds um, to the distinction between natural evil and moral <coughs> evil and to the free will theodicy by saying that he is a hard determinist and that uh, that's where the evidence points. Well, I'm, I'm a libertarian. Um, most theists are libertarians. And so if you're saying that your responses to the argument from evil depend on something that theists in general don't agree with, then all I can say is, well, okay, well, I see why this would be a problem for you, but not for me, because I don't agree with the premises that you're using in your argument. Um, Farhan says uh, that he doesn't understand, you know, what free will is, that he, he's not clear on what free will is, um, and, you know, some people in here might not be, uh, be clear on that as well. Take Farhan's Hitler example. So the hard determinist would say exactly what Farhan has said. That, um, that if you were in Hitler's position, you had his DNA, you had his genetics, you had his upbringing, uh, you had his brain chemistry, you would do exactly what Hitler did. The libertarian would say, yes, we understand that genetics plays a role in what we do. Yes, we understand that uh, our upbringing plays a role in what we do. We understand that all of this plays a role, but there's something left over. There's something left over. There is the self or the agent or what you want to, or the soul or whatever you want to call it uh, that makes, that means that you're not determined absolutely by the sorts of things that, that happen. So um, for a definition of uh, libertarian free will, there is compatibilist free will, which would be a, uh, a bit different, um, but free will in the libertarian sense uh, would have usually a couple of requirements. One, that there be alternative <coughs> possibilities. So that if you did have the same DNA and the same upbringing as Hitler, you could have done something else. So there would have been alternative possibilities open to you. And two, uh, another requirement is that, that the difference in the choice you made can't just be random, right? So if there was an involuntary spasm in my arm, that might not have happened, well, that's, that's an alternative possibility, but it's not something I, I control. Uh, so if you think, you know, just as an example, if you're thinking about where to go to school, where to go, if you're going to go to Rutgers, or you're thinking about some uh, other place, um, could you actually make a different decision if you could go back and have the same opportunity over again to, to rethink your decision? Could you do something else that's not based on a random fluctuation in your brain or something like that, but something you actually had control over. And the, the reason I've never been persuaded by hard determinism is there are certain things, there are certain things um, that human beings experience and might seem real to us, might seem the way things are to us, but then we find out that there's a better source of information about how things are. So uh, lots of people way back in the day thought it was really obvious that the sun is going around the earth. If the if it were if, if the, the if it were somehow different if uh, the Earth is going around the Sun that means the Earth is hurling through space and the Earth is spinning real fast that's obviously not true that's obviously ridiculous right uh, and it turned out to be exactly that way the Earth is moving through space rapidly the Earth is spinning rapidly even though it doesn't seem like that to us so in this case things seem a certain way but there's a better source of information out there namely you take lots of uh, you, t you assemble lots of data about how uh, things move and then you put it together in the best picture and you find out well the way things seem to you isn't accurate and let's turn now to uh, how my free will works uh, what better source of information is there about how my will works than my personal experience of how my will works um, Farhan takes it as obvious given uh, given psychology and so on that we are determined to do exactly what we do well Here's a situation where my experience would tell me something very different. If I sit here and think, you know, if I raise my arm, could I have not raised my arm? Could I have made the different decision? Or could I have lowered my arm or something like that? Can I walk over here? Uh, could I have, it, given that I just moved, could I have not moved? Could I have done this? And it just seems, I mean, intuitively obvious to me that I do have uh, voluntary control in that sense and that given the same opportunity to, to rethink things, I could have done something very differently. Um, so the question is, since that's how things seem to me, is there a better source of information somewhere out there in the world about how my decision-making process works? And the answer here, I think, is no. Uh, there is no 
greater source of information about my will than how I experience my will. That's something that is internal. Uh, you can study my brain all you want. You will never know more about my mind than I do. Study my brain all day long. Uh, so there is no better source of information about how our decision-making processes work than ourselves. And again, I, by the way, my case doesn't depend on this. This is the argument from evil. Farhan is rejecting theodicies and rejecting distinctions about evil based on his view of the, the determinism versus free will debate. So it's up to him to, if his entire case is going to, be, to rest on that somehow, to show that determinism is true, and he would have to uh, show that uh, theists in general and most people in the world who actually believe they have free will are wrong. Otherwise, the case just isn't going to be persuasive. Um, Farhan says that uh, skeptical theism doesn't take away the problem of evil. Uh, I agree, uh, but we, we, we need a distinction here. There is kind of a problem of evil, namely, um, you theists believe in God, why is there so much suffering in the world? It's very different when we're using it as an argument. When, it when you transform it from hey, this puzzles me about your worldview, or hey, you know, I'm wondering how this fits into my worldview. When you transform it from that into, here's an argument, here are my premises, here's the conclusion, the logic is valid, this refutes your view and shows you that your worldview is false, that has just, that has just transformed what's, it, what's, what's going on. Now it's an argument. If you're offering an argument, whether you're a theist, whether you're an atheist, you are intellectually obligated to show that you have a good argument. Here are my premises. Here I, here's how I can show that they are true. Now that I've shown that my premises are true, you can see that the logic is valid, and therefore the conclusion follows from the premises. The conclusion in this case that God doesn't exist, not the sort of God that, uh, that theists generally believe in. So, when we're talking about that, whether there's an argument against the existence of God from evil, then if the skeptic or the atheist or the agnostic is assuming, is assuming from the beginning that the theist has to have access to God's reasons for allowing suffering, then I would just ask you to defend that premise. Um, if you're saying that God, whose intellect is vastly superior to mine, has reasons for allowing suffering, that I am somehow intellectually obliged to have access to those and be able to report them to you, Please defend that. But the thing, the thing is, it, it's not true according to <coughs> theism. I've never met a theist who says, you know, I have access to all of God's reasons for what he does. I'm not saying this solves the problem of evil. I'm saying this is a problem for the person who is offering this as an argument against theism. You have an undefended premise in your argument that you're not stating. You're just assuming it. And you would never let me get away with that if I were offer, offering an argument for the existence of God. If I were assuming something. Uh, from the beginning, it helps my case, and you would obviously say, hey, you, you just assumed this from the beginning, you need to defend that. And that's, that's all I'm saying. And the bottom line is, there is no defense of it. There is no defense of the claim that human beings would have access to God reason. And, and really, I mean, if, if anyone's having trouble understanding this, this makes perfect sense. Um, I, I showed you a, a picture of my disabled son. Uh, he's, when he's a baby, we had to do some, some bad things, some painful things. Uh, shots, operations, and so on, just to keep him alive. Imagine if he could formulate an argument in his head. Wow, these are my parents right here. Uh, they, they act like they love me, but look at all the stuff they're doing to me. Look at all the stuff they're putting me through. This is horrible. Um, he doesn't have access to why we're doing this. He has no concept of, of our reasons for, for what we do. And so, I mean, it would, if he formulated an argument based on what we're doing to him, he would end up with a very false conclusion. Why? because he doesn't have access to our reasons. And I would say that the difference between human beings and God is much greater than the difference between babies and uh, adults. Uh, with all of that said, I'm pointing that out as a problem for the argument of the theist. I mean, for the argument of the atheist. What I would say is, uh, at best, given this faulty assumption, at best, you could ask, you could request of the theist, hey, can you, can you give me some general ideas of why God might allow some of these things. And here, I think theists uh, can. Uh, I would take it for granted that God is not obligated to give us a, a perfect world, um, given the sorts of things that we do. Um, so what about some of the other reasons? Well, I think most people know from experience that we don't tend to grow uh, when things are going very well for us, and that therefore at least some, at least some suffering in the world 
is necessary for the development of virtues like courage and compassion and so on. In fact, you can't have courage or compassion if you don't have something going wrong in the world. Uh, now, Farhan says that uh, according to Christianity, so this would be a particular objection to Christianity, there's no purpose for the soul building. And here I, I just have no clue what he means. Some things are good in themselves. When the, uh, when the, when the poor woman tosses a couple of coins that were basically worthless into the offering, and other people are going by tossing in large, rich people are walking by tossing in large bags of money, well, who, who kicked in more money? The rich people. And yet Jesus said the, the poor woman, who had basically nothing and chipped in basically nothing, did something far greater. What's that mean? It was, and it, it, was, it was something that she did that didn't have tremendous consequences, but was, was good in itself. It's something that's good, not for its consequences, it's just better. And if you, I mean, if you, if this isn't clear, I mean, just think about it. Uh, you know, if I go over in the room in there and, you know, I try to help someone and no one knows about it versus going in the room and, you know, trying to molest a child or something like that, no one knows about it. Or is there a difference there? Yes, there is a massive difference there. Uh, one is a good act, the other is an evil act, regardless of the consequences. And, uh, and my time is up, so we'll, we'll certainly continue. I didn't get to some of the points, but uh, I'll be back in a second. Thank you, David. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go backwards because David talked about that there's a difference between two to uh, a moral act and an immoral act. But but as far as I understand the Christian theological narrative is that there isn't a difference. Remember that anything good that you could possibly do, he's talking about greater goods. He's talking about good that we do see in the world. It it isn't good to God. It's it's, it's again it's uh, it's an act of uh, iniquity. It's 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 as if it is filthy rags. It's irrelevant to God. And so from the Christian theological perspective, the soul-building theodicy, um, it fails. And, and as a matter of fact, according to the Christian narrative, again, we know why evil entered the world. That we do have access to, to God's reason that, that, that it entered the world. And the reason is because uh, Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Hence, all sin and all evil entered the world. This is an act of retribution against humanity who, 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 is, uh, who, who is sinful. And, and my problem with that is, again, the, aside from the philosophical issue of determinism, this is theological determinism here, is that, again, Adam and Eve, God could have created, could have chosen to create otherwise, but did not. He could have uh, ch uh, chosen to create uh, simply a, a heavenly paradise without the ability to sin, without any suffering, without any misery, w uh, w without any evil. But God did not. God specifically chose to, to create a world where, where evil and suffering occurred. Um, and so there is no soul to be built because inevitably we are, we are evil. We are sinful. And the only thing that we can do for ourselves is believe that 2,000 years ago that God incarnated himself as a Jewish man and violently and dramatically was killed. That's the best we can do against, against the scenario that we're dealing with from a Christian theological perspective. Um, now, in terms of the free will determinism issue, he says, he says that it's intuitively obvious that I can do this or do that. And that is how it is perceived. But the scientific data, which, it, which can be provided in terms of psychology and, and neuroscience, says otherwise. My, 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 again, when we talk about determinism, we're simply talking about antecedent causal circumstances. These antecedent causal circumstances include genetics, include brain chemistry, include intelligence. Our IQ is not in our control. We have no control at all over how intelligent our biological organism is. We have no choice over, over the environment we are born in that would condition us and, and, and bring us up and give us the, the experiences that we're having. The internal and external stimuli that we are responding to are completely out of our control. So if we, if David says that there's something else left over. But again, you have the, 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 the plethora of uh, causal circumstances that are guiding our behavior and, and the way that we function in the world and the way that we perceive reality. And on top of that, we have Satan that's misguiding us to do evil. <coughs> It would seem as if all odds are against us. So what else is left over? And again, uh, the, the, the scientific evidence, both in terms of, uh, it's not an issue of just, uh, just studying brain chemistry. It's, stu it's an issue of, of studying uh, uh, human behavior as well. Everybody knows 
the, the classical conditioning um, from Psychology 101 Pavlov demonstrated with, with the dog that, that the dog would salivate upon the ring of the bell instead of the food. The dog was conditioned that way. And so are human beings conditioned in a plethora of ways. Again, if you were born in a Christian home and become attached to your identity, you find consolatory reasons for, 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 for existence in your Christian faith. You become attached to that emotionally. Or if you're a Muslim and you become attached to that emotionally, that is going, that is going to formulate your biases and how you perceive, perceive reality the way that you do. And so again, I would contend that nobody in their right state of mind would reject truth knowingly. Uh, I, I've, studied, I've studied Christianity to an extent, and, and I do not want to go to hell, honestly. Uh, that's not somewhere I want to go, where there's eternal suffering. And again, bringing up the, the hell issue, is that there's suffering inside of hell too. There is no soul building in hell. There is no free will in hell. The suffering is an act of retribution and punishment from God. There is no other reason for evil in the world according to the biblical narrative. If there is, I would like to know what it is. <coughs> okay, I think I think that I'm gonna hear because I sent a day for that to see how that goes. Farhan continues to say that according to Christianity, our acts don't matter because our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's what the Bible says. There it's talking about our righteousness before God in the sense of uh, do we live up to God's standards? And the answer according to the Bible is no, you don't live up to God's standards. God is perfect. You can't live up to, you're not going to live up to that standard. Uh, does this mean that no act is good or bad or that there is no such thing as virtue or that a person can't become better or that it's not better to be courageous than a coward or that it's not better to be compassionate than uh, something else? Uh, is that what that means? Is, is that the <coughs> biblical position? Um, all kinds of passages we could, we could go to here uh, in the Bible if, we're going to, if, if this is going to be part of the argument from evil now uh, and that's uh, that a kind of soul-building theodicy is inconsistent with Christianity. Let's just read a, a quick passage from the Bible. It's from Romans 5. So Paul, who quotes the Old Testament passage, Our Righteousnesses as Filthy Rags, also says in the book of Romans, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, has, uh, who was given to us. So, let's review here. We exult in our tribulations. Why? Because tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character. The sufferings we go through lead to a better character. What is that? That's a soul-building theodicy in the Bible that Farhan says soul-building theodicies are inconsistent with. Uh, so, obviously, obviously, the, 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 the Apostle Paul takes it for granted that, uh, and again, why is, he, why is he taking this for granted? Because we know these sorts of things from experience. I want to say I am sympathetic to people saying, hey, that doesn't solve the problem of evil, right? Because there are other examples we can look at. You know, I look at my children who might die in their first couple years. Um, most, most children who have the disease that, that my children have do die after several years. Um, so I look at that and how, what, what, how is their soul being built? Right? How, are, how are they becoming better people, more virtuous people? So I'm very sympathetic to the claim this doesn't solve all evil, never claimed it did. Uh, free will theodicies, uh, saying that a world where we have free will, even though we might go wrong, is better than a world where we never have any ability to choose. Uh, that's something, again, that is obvious to human beings. You, you, know, you know that a real wife is better than uh, some kind of 
Stepford wife, who's been programmed. What, what's that mean? It means you understand that, uh, there are, that there are good states of affairs that involve free will. Now here, uh, Farhan raises uh, another objection uh, to this concept um, by pointing out that human beings use their free will to sin. God knew this and created us anyway. Now, as a general rule, I reject any claim that would demand my non-existence um, or the non-existence of, of all of you, right? What is Farhan saying? God knew we were going to do wrong things, therefore he shouldn't have created us. Therefore he should have done something else. Um, a, a, a claim calling for our non-existence. The world would have been better if we had never been created. I reject that uh, in itself. Uh, but let me, give you, let me give you another example, uh, since I've been talking about children since it came up. Um, I have a couple of healthy children, a couple of children with a genetic uh, muscle disorder. Um, all of my children I knew before I ever had them were going to do bad things. I know that. If, you have a, if, you, if, you have a, if you're about to have a kid, hasn't been born yet, I will tell you <laughs> right now. That kid is going to be a liar. Uh, he's probably going to steal something. He's going he's to be, he's gonna do all kinds of bad things. Do we really say, wow, we better stop having children. We better, we, the world would just be better off if we, if we just stopped having children, didn't have any more kids, because all those future generations of kids are going to do bad things. We can, we can prevent a lot of suffering in this world if we just stop having kids. True. Absolutely true. We could prevent all suffering right now. Just nuclear holocaust. Let's just nuke the entire planet. No more suffering ever. Is that really better? Is that a is that a better kind of world? Um, I don't know. It, I hear that a lot from uh, atheists and agnostics today. That this world would be better if we were never here. God shouldn't have done it. God knew. God God knew that that this these things were going to happen and shouldn't have created us. And wow, wow. Um, here again, here again, if that's what your argument is depending on, um, your argument just isn't going to be very persuasive uh, to people who see the world differently. So again, the, the classic traditional version of the argument from evil rests on some very straightforward premises. And if you can combine those premises and show that the conclusion follows, uh, you've, got, you've got a pretty solid argument there. Problem is when it comes time to actually defend the premises and and start uh, filling in the holes and responding to the objections, you start getting into all these, all these weird issues where lot, most people aren't going to agree with you. Most people aren't going to agree that the world would be better if none of us existed. And most people aren't going to agree that they have no free will, that free will is just some kind of illusion. Most people aren't going to agree with these things. So if your argument is depending on them, the argument is only going to be persuasive to you. It's not going to be an argument that you could, um, that you could defend. Farhan says that the scientific evidence shows we're determined. Classic example of overstatement. Um, there is scientific evidence that shows that the choices we make are related quite a bit uh, to things like our genetics, to things like our brain chemistry, to our brains. We know this. Um, but the, you know, the determinist wants to take things a step further and say, therefore, the scientific evidence proves that, that free will is an illusion. Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. That is a radical, radical claim to say that all my experience, all my life, of I can go to Burger King, I can go to McDonald's, or, or even bigger decisions. Um, it was all an illusion. My mind was made up. Uh, the moment I was born into this world, that's the way things were, and I never actually had a real, genuine decision that depended uh, on anything other than the way things were uh, long before I was born. Um, that is a radical claim, and if your argument is depending on that, and your basis for rejecting uh, theodicies or anything else depends on that, then once again, you've got an argument that just isn't going to be persuasive. So where are we? Uh, we're asking if God exists, why does evil exist? Um, given some possible reasons for allowing some suffering, and given uh, the, the difference between uh, the level of human beings and the level of God, I think that's the best that theist can, uh, can be uh, expected to do. And we see there are all kinds of reasons um, for God to allow suffering, and certainly more that, are, uh, that we don't have access to or that we don't even talk about tonight. There are dozens of theodicies that have been offered by uh, philosophers. Um, I haven't seen any kind of clear evidence that there is a successful argument from evil, and I'm starting to wonder if there is one. Okay, 
uh, I, I guess I want to start off with the, the, the issue of the nuclear holocaust and non-existence. I'm, I'm not opposing that, that it would be better for us to not exist, nor am I arguing that, that, that it would be better for us to not, not exist. I, I'm wondering why there must be evil. Why could, not, why could not God choose otherwise? Why couldn't he create a world where there was no suffering? where there was no evil, where there would be no capacity to sin. And the fact of the matter is that that's, if, if God is an omnipotent and omnibenevolent God, you said, you're arguing that God is all-loving and all-powerful, that God could have chosen to do otherwise. God actually wants to choose to do otherwise because he loves each and every one of us. And yet, two-thirds of humanity, according to, to, to Christian doctrine, deserves to go to hell because they do not believe that uh, within time and space Jesus had to have been killed on a cross. Um, where there is eternal suffering with no purpose except retribution. With no purpose except for punishment. In, in, in the model of, of, uh, that, that brings about um, the, the free will versus determinism in, in a criminal justice model, the reality of the situation is that these criminals don't deserve to be punished. These killers and these rapists and, 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 and these terrible people, the, the, the terrible behavior that we say, they don't they need to be punished. They need to be rehabilitated because they are psychologically disturbed beyond their control. Nobody in their right state of mind would want to kill somebody. Nobody in their right state of mind would want to, would, would, would want to rape somebody. These are psychological disturbances that have antecedent causal circumstances. People are born into situations where they have these urges or they develop these urges beyond their control to a large extent, if not, in, um, if not entirely. And it's, again, it's very easy for us to say that we, that we would never do such a thing because we've been brought up a certain way or we've been the ones to have the lucky genes and, and the right and, and a, norm, a normal set of uh, a normal uh, brain chemistry state. In terms of again, I, I, what I want to argue is relative perception. That each and every person does the best that they can do within within their given capacity. Each and every one of us has a perception of reality. Whether you're an atheist, whether you're a Muslim, whether you're you're a Hindu whether you're an agnostic, you have a perception of reality. And the best that you can do is, is, is work with that perception of reality that you have. Inevitably, you are going to have biases. Inevitably, you are going to have delusions. We all do. But that's the best that we can do. And God has to understand that. In order to provide justice, He has to understand that. But instead of, of there being soul-building, there's, there's judgment based on doctrinal beliefs. And the problem of evil, like I said, is defined biblically speaking. Adam and Eve sinned against God. We, are in, we, 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 we have this original sin. We naturally are sinners. And therefore, the suffering and evil that exists in this world and the suffering that we will endure in the afterlife is a retribution of God against us. There's no other reason in the Bible that I've seen uh, that, that explains why evil exists other than, other than Adam and Eve's sin and, and when we, 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 we are evil creatures that, don't, that, that cannot meet, like David said, do not line up to God's standards. But God created us that way. God created the precise circumstances to make this come about. God could have chosen to do otherwise. But he did not, and so I'm not. Again, I'm not arguing against our non-existence. I'm not saying that because evil exists, that God does not exist. What I'm saying it is that it's not plausible or feasible for there to be an omnipotent, all-powerful God and an omnibenevolent, all-loving God, and for evil to exist the way that it does within a Christian theological framework. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Ron. Uh, I'll go ahead and respond to um, his, his final comments and then offer some of my own. Um, Farhan says he's just wondering why God didn't choose some other world. Is, 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 is that the argument tonight? I'm, I'm wondering why God didn't choose some other kind of world rather than our own. Well, if, if that's the question at the end of the day, I mean, fine. I wonder why everyone does all kinds of things. Uh, we can wonder all day long. The question is, is there some kind of argument that shows uh, from principles that people generally believe in or that, or that theists generally believe in that shows that theism is somehow irrational or implausible? And I, I certainly haven't seen that. I've never seen it. Um, so, in other words, we can wonder things all day long. I can sit here. I wonder why God. I'm with Farhan. I wonder all. I wonder all the time why, what God's doing. Right? You go to the you go to the Bible. You open up the Book of Psalms all the time. God, why are you doing this? What are you doing here? Why aren't you saving me? Why aren't you punishing my enemies? What's going on here? People wonder all the time. Uh, I wonder what I wonder what my wife's thinking half the time. Um, <laughs> why she does the things she does. Why my kids do the things they do. It never occurs to me to say, well, therefore my wife doesn't exist and my kids don't exist because I don't I don't get this. Um, so, uh, if at the end of the day it's just a question, I'm sympathetic to the question. I'm sympathetic to asking, you know, hey, I, I really wonder why God does this rather than that. But that's not an argument against theism. Um, Farhan says criminals don't need to be punished, they need rehabilitation. You know, I've been fighting all night against this claim that uh, there's no distinction between moral evil and, and natural evil. Now I, I don't know why. I mean, Farhan did away with all moral evil. Now all I have to explain is the, is the natural evil. Uh, so he did away with one entire category uh, of evil by saying that, you know, it's, we're all just determined to do the things we do and we're not really responsible. Okay, um, granted. I'll grant that for the sake of argument. Um, so the question is, why is, there, um, why is there natural evil? And a lot of the uh, responses uh, have already been discussed. Uh, Farhan says, God could have created us differently uh, so that we don't do the sorts of things that we do. Uh, I agree. God could have made a world full of Stepford wives who do everything perfectly. God decided to create a world full of people who, um, who sin, who choose to sin, who choose to do wrong, who choose to rebel, and God chose, even beforehand, as Farhan has been pointing out all night long, uh, to redeem them through the work of Jesus Christ. Um, Farhan is free to say, I wonder why God did something like that, uh, but given Farhan's shaky, shaky moral foundation on determinism, I don't know how he can say, therefore, my, wor my moral values are the correct ones and God's are wrong. How do you say that, right? In other words, if you say, here's how God chose to do things, I have a problem with it. Well, I mean, Farhan, if you're, you know, if you're determined to, to have a problem with this or, or something, um, I'm wondering how that, uh, how that affects how seriously we can take your claims. For Han is telling us, hey, he's just been determined to, to think this way. Well, why should I think that the way you've been determined to think um, is a correct way to think about God, or a correct way to judge God? In other words, if we're just this product of particles in motion and, and upbringing, why should I trust any conclusions for Han makes about what's right and wrong? He was determined to think that way. I have no basis for saying, well, you know, I, I really need to think about what he's saying about morality here and apply it to God. Uh, I don't understand the basis. Um, so uh, the point here uh, that I've been trying to get across is I don't think theists can sit here and say, here's why God allows that instance of evil. Here's why he allows that instance of evil. And some of the uh, traditional responses that have been given in the world of, uh, of philosophy, I think they explain some evil, uh, certainly not every instance of evil we find. Um, but guess what? That's my point. That's my point tonight, because uh, I call this the skeptic's dilemma. The skeptic's dilemma. Um, I pointed out that people can be inconsistent in the level of skepticism they're applying to various arguments. We've seen that there are lots of problems with the argument from evil. There are lots of things the atheist just, or the agnostic or the skeptic just can't defend. Well, the atheist has a choice in being consistent. The atheist can either say, um, well, I I'm going to let this argument slide anyway. You can do that, right? You can say, even though there are all these problems, I'm going to let the argument slide anyway. Well, if that's the case, if that's your standard, then be consistent. I can think of 50 arguments right now for the existence of God that you're going to have to let slide if you're letting them slide, even though there are problems. Uh, the alternative is to say, well, all the arguments for the existence of God I, that I reject, and I apply this very high level of skepticism, um, 
I'm going to reject all of those if I can find any reason for doubting it. Then fine, be consistent, apply that same high level of skepticism to the argument from evil, and you're going to have to reject your own argument.